it's going. Hello, hello everyone. This is T Rosa with the True Life. How you guys doing today? Blessings to you all. <laughs> it's a wonderful Saturday here in Phoenix, and uh, I'm happy. I'm thanking the Lord for this this day. We, uh, it's for this. I'm this beautiful sunshine, and then I'm I have a special guest on with me today. Uh, a Christian evangelist, Brian Melvin, author. Uh, I'm so happy to have you on with me today. How you doing? I'm doing fine, T. How are you doing down, down in Phoenix? <laughs> <laughs> Trying to stay cool. <laughs> <laughs> About the same here in Colorado. So. <laughs> oh, is it, is it hot there today? I... This is the first cool day, just in the low 90s, so... <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Awesome, yeah. Well, I'm 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 uh, so happy to have you on the show. Um, I don't know. Uh, we have a lot of viewers on the Truth Live that I haven't been on for a while, guys. So I want to say uh, thank you guys for joining us today. And, and Minister Rochelle, uh, she was under the weather. Here she uh, and she wanted me to tell you guys hi. She may pop in. Uh, she had been under the weather for a while, so she hadn't been on with me. And so, uh, but we were so excited about the show today because this, because uh, Evangelist Melvin has had a near-death experience where he was taken to hell. And you guys know that that is one of my interests, like, uh, you know, near-death experiences. And so... Uh, I had to get him on the show. I had to get him on the show because I, I've been watching his, watching him and just seeing how awesome how God has been using him, his testimony. And uh, I just wanted the viewers to be able to hear this amazing testimony that God has given him where he, what he was able to see and feel and experience and, and, and hell and, and hell. If you heard that, if you, and so some, and like, uh, uh, some of you got, it may be some people watching now that, you know, you don't believe in hell, you know, and there's some atheists, you know, that people, they are agnostics and they, you know, they're wondering if it actually is a hell. So were you, were you always an atheist, Brother Melvin? Well, when that happened, I was, I was, you know, I grew up in, uh, Virginia at the time with my parents and as a young kid I grew up in a Christian home but that didn't make me a Christian it's just that life takes you through a loop sometimes and through your life experiences I just fell away from anything about Christianity I didn't want I was never saved never made a commitment so I bounced around when I got uh, up I say in sixth grade fifth grade whatever and then on on through middle school <clears throat> bounced around between agnosticism and atheism and then by 1980 when this event happened um i was a full-blown militant atheist at that time so you just i mean i you hated god like you didn't believe in god i mean i heard you say on an you know before that you said you hated god i mean mm. wow. and so uh did you so what so can you tell us a little bit what happened like a backstory of what happened that day in 1980 not sure well when I, <clears throat> excuse me when i was younger you know as i grew up as a just had a chip on my shoulder about god because all the stuff that happened to me in my life as well as watching other things go on in the world I had a lot of questions like why if god was so good why was he evil how could god predestine this person to hell and this one to not so i just turned me off against uh everything about christianity anything about god i just became a militant atheist and i had a chip on my shoulder and <clears throat> excuse me and so later i 1980, we moved to Tucson, Arizona, and a friend of mine and I and another guy came down later, and we ended up in Tucson. That's where I found a job. I was an electrician at the time, and uh, I was working at a construction site, and that's where I accidentally drank some bad contaminated water by accident. It was left in a cooler by a supervisor who happened to be a Christian, <laughs> and so... and. I accidentally drank a lot of it and I ended up contracting cholera and who knows what else I contracted because 
after I drank the water and I gave it to a friend to drink, a co-worker, he opened it up. He didn't really drink too much of it, but it was like a algae-laced putrid petri dish of water with little wormy things swimming around in it. And uh, so who knows what else I got. So I contracted cholera. Basically, you dehydrate really quick within uh, at the about the three to, three to four day mark. Um, is when your body usually goes into shock and that's exactly what happened and it was near the fourth of july when it happened i think it was right just before the fourth that weekend before the fourth and for the holidays in uh, i had to get off work early i got sick it was the within 12 hours of drinking the water i had my symptoms i got real sick and went home and then my friends or my roommates that rented with me they were going to go over to phoenix they knew somebody who had a plane they were going to fly up to the grand canyon and fly down into it and stuff and spend the day up there and i thought that would be cool but i couldn't make it i didn't want to ruin their trip but uh later as i found out about cholera your your body goes into shock and your symptoms are really bad. I had stomach uh, cramps or stomach pain, like razor blades in my stomach, I was losing fluid out of both ends. I had a high fever and possibly a, uh, another bacteria called Shingilla as well. And so I, my body went into shock and I felt, this is this medical every textbook case, I felt great. I felt okay, told my friends, you got me all better, I, I, I'm getting up, I'm walking around now, pain's gone, you guys take off to the Grand Canyon, I'll be all right. So I wrote about that in my book. They left the area, or they got in their car, and they drove off to go to Phoenix and so forth and catch and get their friend's airplane, whatever that was, that we set up. And, and so as soon as they left is when I fell on the kitchen floor and my dog was having a fit and it took me a long time to get into the restroom and I had an incident there and it was a big mess and managed to crawl into the bedroom and somehow climb back in bed in excruciating pain and I was, uh, a fever was really bad, could hardly breathe and I didn't know what was going on. I knew that this was pretty bad. I couldn't, I couldn't fight it. So basically I laid on my back. I started to try to pat my dog's chin, try to tell my dog, Lassie, go get help, but that doesn't work. And so it, I, I, I died. I took my last breath. I remember that. And then when I took my last breath, I, I could see without my glasses. I was facing my clock. It was 10 till noon. I could see my dog. I know my hand went through her chin. She was whimpering and going around in circles, kind of frantic, and looked up at me as I was going and floating above my body. And as soon as I took my last breath, I lost my atheism because I knew that was a lie. Um, I used to believe that you were a dead hunk of meat when you died and there couldn't be no God or whatever. But when I died, um, I took my last breath and could see my body. I felt wonderful. I felt really great. And everything felt really good. And I was at peace. And I went through the ceiling, and went on up through the ceiling, and then went past the swamp cooler. And uh, we didn't have, there was no air conditioning back then where, where we had. We had swamp cooler, and went past the swamp cooler, had a bailing wire and a bandana around holding it together where the, where you have the uh, access port for the, to change the pads inside, the water, water filter. And I went right past that. I could see the kids down the street kicking the can. I could hear the neighbors in the house next door fighting. <clears throat> Everything I saw when I came back happened. After I had to go up and change the water filter. And sure enough, the after I came back to life, I, a week or about a month later, I had to go change the water filter. It did have a bandana tied around it. It did have bailing wire. And I fixed all that because I was... That's what I did, <laughs> fix things. So I fixed that, and I saw that when I was going up there. So I knew, know this happened. And when I entered in, as soon as I died, I took my last breath. I was in a dark void, and I felt really at peace. Never knew anything about after-death experiences, near-death experience. I wouldn't have believed them at the time if anybody told me. And I, but I was more alive than I am now, floating through a black void, going toward this light. I was hearing this. Uh, really beautiful music and this beautiful singing in another language, but I can understand every word that was being said. 
And at the same time, bits and pieces of my life would flash before my eyes. And and what the music and what the this heavenly choir was singing here was the mysteries of God's character and explaining things about God's character traits would be too long to take um, for people to even uh, get into that right now. But it was just hearing all that, feeling at peace, feeling this great sense of love and compassion, you know, overwhelming me. I didn't realize that I was heading toward a reckoning. I was at peace. And I felt this great love of God, but it was some, you know, and if I was resuscitated at that time and came back at that time, my testimony would be different. But just hear me now, you know, just, but as I was floating through this void, I kept seeing how I saw how school teachers, teachers, movies, media, how things in the world, how I myself did all paint it, God and Christianity as oppressive and closed minded, restrictive, stick in the mud, how they were cruel. And they were the enemy of all fun. You could have fun if you're a Christian, you know. And uh, they were against the uh, do as thou mentality that I had at that time. I was just wanted to do whatever I wanted to do. And I, it was like I was seeing all those events. And, uh, you know, a lot of atheists uh, are really angry at God. I was really angry at God because I thought that I owed... Uh, you know, God owed me an apology for making the making the world, you know, and how dare he make the world so bad. If I was God, I wouldn't do, do it this way. Never realizing as I was floating through that void, his love was showing me something about it. his great love was that he makes the rain fall on the just and the unjust. He gives you a chance. He gives you free moral will. What have I done with this gift? That's what was hitting me at the time. And so when I came closer to the light, I saw that it was coming from a figure that was standing upon a big rock. And I was coming really close to uh, the rock. And this rock was suspended in the darkness. And behind the rock was, um, it looked like a city. Then it just bailed over. Then I landed feet first in, uh, before this figure. He was standing upon the rock. And as soon as I saw him and he was really close, I fell down at his feet. I mean, I collapsed like a dead sack of wheat. He wore a hood, and somebody picked me up and planted me right in front of him. And and he started looking at me and start you know, and he started communicating with me by kind of like means of thought. And he, it was like it was a reckoning because I saw how I took advantage of God's goodness, His mercy, and grace for my own ends. He gave me good parents. I mean, it was a very rare thing to have good parents. I had great parents. And how I treated them, and um, how I took advantage of people, how I betrayed people, how I justified rejecting people, abandoning people, how I sold drugs to the church youth group, <laughs> and all that stuff I was doing that back in those days, and got in trouble and all this stuff. You know, I was just just bad news. That's all I was. I was taking advantage of God's grace, and. You know, people think God is so mean, he should just do, 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 Well, you know, if you look at what's going on in the world today as an example, you have a group of people who want to dictate how you must live your life now. And you own nothing and you will be happy about it. That's, a, that's the way the devil is. That's, 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 and, and the devil likes to make God look that way. And that's exactly how I live my life, just like that. So I justified betraying people, abandoning people, uh, mocking people putting people on trial in my mind. So all the stuff was being uh, shown to me at the time. And I used people like a commodity. I thought I was justified in doing it. And, you know, I crucified relationships and I inflicted wounds. I hurt my parents. I hurt relatives, you know. I stole drugs out of their medical, uh, medicine cabinets and all this other stuff. And then at the same time, I saw how good God was to me despite how bad I was. He spared my life many times uh, from car wrecks, for example. He spared me from uh, getting injured and killing a bunch of people in one particular car wreck as we were, I was drunk. We had fought. Wow. A bunch of my friends were in the car. We flew down the road, went over a hill, did a Dukes of Hazard, went airborne. I was heading toward a huge oak tree and somehow the car moved 
and land it back on the road and I didn't go off the road. I don't know how I did it. I mean, all I know is that I look back on it. Some angel must have moved the car. So God, you know, revealed that to me. That's what exactly what happened. He spared my life. And what did I do? I just spoke, stuck my finger in his eye, just blamed him for all the evil in the world, not realizing I'm the, I'm the cause of a lot of it. That was the horrible thing I saw. And I saw how many times Jesus reached out to me and uh, I just slapped his hands away and made fun of him. Um, well, a lot of people think they can play the victim card and waltz into heaven because God will love them and just uh, let them in. That's just pride because you're, you can't play the victim card with God because God will show you how many victims you made in your life. And so that's what I was seeing at that time. And so uh, I stood before the Lord. I was totally convicted and I realized this was a reckoning because I wasn't uh, I realized there was a heaven and I knew there was a hell and I knew I wasn't going to <laughs> heaven because eternity seals the deal once you're dead you can't you can't change the only way you can change is in this mortal life you know I was under God's great grace I'm allowed to even come back and that's how I got saved after I came back in this life there's no afterlife salvation I mean, it seals the deal here because why is that? People ask, why is that? Simple is that when you're floating through the void and you're hearing this beautiful music, God is a God of truth. And since God is a God of truth, he's going to reveal every attribute of himself to you, just like he did me. And at that point, I know a lot about God that I could gain because what's going to stop me? I know he's not going to exterminate me to non-existent land because that's contrary to God being a life-giving God. Uh, I think it's first or second Samuel chapter seven there or whatever uh, talks about a wise woman giving D David a prophecy he says that God will not take away life even though we will die he will not take away life it's Ecclesiastes chapter three talks about God puts eternity in our hearts that's a gift he's not going to take any of those gifts away that's how the devil got away with rebellion because he got he, way I live my life was pretty much how the devil teaches everybody. You pit God's character traits against each other. You may not even know you're doing it. That's exactly what I was doing. If God so so loved me, then whatever, he would give me all my wants. And, and he doesn't, then he's not good enough. Whatever I was thinking at the time. But I stood before the Lord and I saw how ugly I was on the inside, how I made life ugly and everything else. I was totally guilty at that time. And I remember him standing there and telling me that um, I would see a land unknown that's best forgotten. Exactly what he said. And when you arrive at this place, say my name and my title. Uh, you, um, the option to return is still to be decided. That's exactly what he said. And mm -hmm. I knew exactly what he meant. I mean, I was like, was I really going to return? And he said at an appointed time, um, you know, you will tell people about what happened. Well, that's kind of, and all of a sudden I was lifted up and went into uh, through another like a door that opened up like a scroll, and I went through a tunnel, a tunnel like vortex, like an inside of a tornado. It was hot and it was really smelled bad. And I could hear all this um, vile language and um, hellish language is what I call called call it. And so. So after I was going through this tunnel and hearing this thing, it was, uh, it was like the inside of a tornado. It was hotter than hot. And when I reached the end of it, and sort of yellow was dent at the end, I fell through the sky and landed with a thud in what I call the land unknown. You know, and I didn't know what to expect. I thought it would be fire, pitchforks, and all that. I had no idea. Uh, it was not what I expected because I found myself bouncing on the ground. I stood up and I was on a hill and there was a valley, a, a small valley, a real steep, and there another rise and a house on a hill on there with a dilapidated dead looking tree with leaves falling off of it. And all of a sudden all these people came through the windows, ran out of the house and were welcoming me to paradise. They came down the, into the valley, came up and surrounded me and welcomed me to paradise. But these were really not people. And they, uh, I kept saying, you know, these look like people who died before, but uh, this something's not right about them. And then they appeared as people who I knew were still alive. I said, you are not these people. 
Then they began to morph into what they were, and they were hellish beings who loved to mimic and degrade humanity. And now surrounded by these demonic entities who look like, some of them look like gargoyles without wings, others look like ancient pagan deities, like the Mesopotamian deities, others look like deformed beings of various sizes, some look like insects, reptilians, like, uh, they were, um, so there were just all shapes and sizes. Out of the ground came these white moths with these teeth in them and these uh, little wormy things that snap at your feet. Everything yelling at blasphemies. And I felt like I was going to be devoured by these people. And that's when I remember Jesus says, say my name and my title. And you feel overwhelming. And I started saying his name fast as I could. Jesus Christ, Jesus, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, without stopping the whole time I was there. And he gave me permission to. And they rushed me. These people, things rushed me. And they wanted to tear me to shred. But as soon as I said the name of Jesus, they could not grab hold of me. They punched me. They could touch me. And, but they couldn't, they couldn't gnaw me to death. It was like they're going to devour me or something. And so there's power in the name of Christ, folks, in the name of Jesus. You can't tell me that now. Yes, right. Amen. Amen. So yeah, one hit. What's that? T? I said amen. 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 I'm just listening. I'm listening. I love <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, let's continue then. So uh, I was confronted by this one hideous creature. He's about four foot eight. And that's what I wrote about in my book, A Land Unknown, Hell's Dominion. And about four foot eight inches tall. He looked like a little dinosaur-like creature. And I named him Lizard Breath. And he came out to me. His breath was so foul, I could never tell you how many eyes he had. It's how bad it stinks. Uh, people who have hallucinations or dreams, you don't, you don't, I mean, a dream you don't smell. You don't, ha you, don't you, you don't feel. You don't, but this stuff I was smelling and feeling. And this thing's breath was the foulest I ever ever fouler than the hip pit of hell I was in probably death yes yeah, like the death. smell of death yeah well, and, and so it, it was like vaporous heat waves like it is in Phoenix you know it comes off the pavement that's what it remind me of mm -hmm. and I call I nicknamed him lizard breath because as after I came back I just nicknamed him that mm -hmm. and um so lizard breath uh was a, had this hellish accent in the language and I can understand it for, and then he would go into I can understand in English and he told me um, to come follow him he offered me half the kingdom and all this stuff curse God curse him curse me curse this curse that you know uh, you can you know you offer you half the kingdom and I just was too scared to say anything so I walked a few steps with him and then suddenly we came to the end of the horizon he stuck his hand in the, in, in the horizon ripped it open it wasn't the horizon I was inside of a cell he ripped the walls open, and he stepped up and out of it, and I followed him. I didn't know what else to do, and I stepped up, and it's kind of hard to explain how fast all this is an instant. I got up out of it. I looked behind me. I came out of a small cell about 10 by 10 or 14 by 14 foot wide. Some people who've seen this place say it's 14 by 14. I wrote 10 by 10 in my book because 10 is easier to spell than 14. <laughs> so what can I say? But, um, you know, so I... I stepped out of it. I looked inside. It looked like it was all outdoors inside. And and yet it was only a, a really small place. And there was these cells or chambers of death on either side of me. Then they were stacked six high above mine. So there was a rows of six stacked of each other. They were layered like a brick, brick, brick layer of wood. And it was a circular. I was in a circular pit. And there was a wide, dusty road. All these entities were escorting people there and these tornado vortexes flying down and dropping people off in these cells. And it was, and then it was very hot. There were some places where I could see fire, like molten rock and uh, other places. And then it was the, what I saw was described in the Bible as the pit of hell. And it's round, just like if, uh, Ezekiel chapter 32 talks about. It's round about. If you imagine a, with me for a bit, bit to give you an idea what this looks like, it's like a circular spiral staircase that never ends. It goes as far as up as you can see or far down as you look. That's it. The stairs would be the road. The bricks in the wall would be the cubes. And the hole is where the tornado vortexes were going and these entities going between the different levels. And so above me, there was... Uh, uh, a level and below me were levels and that's exactly how this looked it was like a, it was a bottomless pit and these people so uh, 
That's what it looked like. So I began looking inside of these cells, and this thing began like taking me on a tour. And I realized this is this was uh, why I wanted to wake up. I was terrified, and so I was on this broad, wide road of, road of destruction, and um, looking inside the cubes, I could I was instantly got a download on the people's life history and why they were there, and the inside of them were sceneries uh, that they were familiar with them there when, when they died, you know, so some of them had been there a long time and you know, they, they'd be in the time period that they knew about it, reaping what they have sown in life. And they had everything explained to them as I, as I had explained to me, they know why they're there and they're not going to be reformed in there in one iota. Don't fool yourself because when you have the real you exposed and there is, uh, um, and you understand something about God's love that I'll talk about if we have time. And, you know, people don't understand. God doesn't want you to go here. This place wasn't designed for us. It was designed for the devil and his minions. But because man fell, uh, here we go. A lot of people are heading there. And so, uh, so I looked inside and these people were living in their small cell. But the, to them, they looked like all outdoors or wherever they were. And so I saw a lot of people. So he just motioned to me. We looked inside these cells. I wrote on some of them in my book there. I saw there's no water in hell. So, um, but I saw this one guy who was a captain of a, uh, of a sailing vessel. And, you know, back in the 1700s or whatever, those, and he liked to control his crew. And so he'd, you know, any infraction, he loved to flog them and he loved to beat them. And, he, and so this time he was being tied to the wheel and being flogged and he was being beaten and then dropped well, they dropped into the ocean and hauled up and all the stuff was happening to him what he did to those souls to those people he did just for the mere pleasure of it was happening to him and, but there was no water there so instead of going into water he got into dirt mm-hmm. yeah and then he come out it was just a strange thing to see mm-hmm. and um he, and he would come out, and then he'd be up there, and then he'd uh, walk around like he's all, like he's God's gift to humanity. Then the crew would rebel and do the nightmares he'd put and poked on them back on him. And that's what I was seeing. He, whatever he did was was being met it back to him. And in the process, his true nature was being brought to the surface is what people do not realize. And... It's only in this life through what Jesus Christ has done for us that we have any chance of redemption. We don't in hell because eternity seals the deal, folks. It really does. And what you sow is what you reap. And what is, like it says in, I think it's Book of Job, and it's, it's cryptic, but it says it too. And I think it's Job 25 or 26, it's verses 4 or 5. It says, Abaddon has no cover, or destruction has no cover. It means hell uncovers what's inside of you. So what's inside of you is going to be uncovered. And it goes on, it says, the, the Raphium are, and also including the dead, um, wail and travail and reap what they have sown. And so what's being, from a biblical standpoint, what's being revealed is a person's sin nature. The real you is being exposed. You're not getting reformed. You're getting worse. Mm. So that captain was getting worse. So other people I saw getting worse. I saw a guy probably, you know, he's on this old style furniture, like the 50s or six, early 60s, tapping his finger on the table and uh, and just going crazy just sitting there bored out of a skull and hearing every single word he spoke to his kids grab me another beer and smack you know you hear he, he he would hear that and then he would relive it and then we walked on to another person we saw other people uh in there in various ways we saw people i saw uh, i wrote in the book about a businessman who died he was in ancient times and he liked to take over people's property <laughs> and just take yeah. it. In the meantime, you throw, yeah, oh, I'm giving all this stuff to the alms to the poor, stuff like that to justify it. But mm-hmm. and so he he hated to be alone. So what was he? He was very alone in this what looked like his house. He nobody taking care of him, no servants, no nothing. He was getting really angry. 
and then people knocked on the door, but there were entities, they came in and had a party and they threw him out <laughs> and tore down his house. And so he, he, he was, he was reaping what he was sown, but he, his anger and stuff, you know, was incredible. I saw another individual and we kind of move on a little bit here. And I don't want to be too redundant picking out a few people here. So this other person I saw was this, uh, about 18, I think it's twenties or whatever it was, the ancient, it was, uh, in uh, Kentucky, the Kentucky revival back in those days. And there was this guy who was never a Christian, but he pretended to be a pastor and he had, he was a best, very lecherous man. He liked his ways with young ladies, you know, really young ladies. Yeah, you let your mind wander on that. And so that's, all, that, that's, that's what he was after. And so he would use the gospel in order to attain that. And he was a very mean spirited person. And so he was sitting there um, <laughs> thinking that he was in this tent revival or out there and all these candles and stuff lit that they did back then. And these people weren't parishioners. They were demons and they got these big black books and then beaten them. And then he ran off and then some entity came into the top of his cube, came in there and Stan began crushing, got him on his back with his throat and put his... Uh, uh, it looks like a bird's foot, talons, legs on his throat, crushing his throat, and it, it was a it was a creepiest looking thing I've ever saw, and yeah. and with his bird's feet trying to crush the guy's larynx, uh, and and you know this guy was reaping what he was sowing. The guy, you know, this this guy was bad bad news, and yeah. so everything he did was coming back to him. I, then we came to another person. I'll kind of wrap this up real quick here so people you know, get an idea what this place is like. And I wrote about this person in my book, A Land Unknown, Hell's Dominion, under the chapter Deer Pudding. And I, like I said, we came to this lady's uh, cell, right? Uh, and I saw her being deposited in her cell. She dropped right in front of it. And like the door knocked or she knocked on the door and it opened and her grandmother answered it. You know, that's how close we were. She looked like her grandmother. And she got in there and went into the through the parlor or the living room. And, you know, she she goes, this she just died in a car wreck, you know. So her grandmother called her pudding. And so did her grandfather. And she said, so, uh, grandmother, grandmother, oh, there's Uncle Henry, there's Uncle Bob. You know, I'm just kind of making up names here, but I don't know, remember their names. But they were, you know, Uncle Bob, Uncle Joe, so forth, et cetera, you know. Wow. So nice to see you. And her grandmother says, oh, dear pudding, yes, dear pudding, welcome to paradise. <clears throat> the same thing that happened to me when I entered my cell, they're welcoming me to paradise. Hmm. Now, if you're wise and listen to what I'm saying here, maybe this is why the Lord had me come back. And I'll keep telling it. A lot of people have, I think God knows everything. He certainly does. He knows that through medical science, people will be resuscitated. Some people come back too soon. So where they were was not paradise. Where they were was not heaven. This lady is in such a place, just like I landed in, 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 I'm talking so much, I'm getting my throat dry. <laughs> you're fine, you're fine. You're fine. So, so she, she, was, she thought that she was in paradise. This was heaven. Now, if she was resuscitated, she would have come back to life. She would have been an Ofra. Everybody would listen to her. All kinds of doctrines that will deny Jesus exists will, will proliferate. And just because of what she would say if she was allowed to come back. But she was, she was not going to come back and she was not resuscitated too soon. So here she was. She thought she was in paradise. And her grandmother, which wasn't her grandmother, because I could see them as the, as the human entities they were projecting as well as what they look really look like some hideous looking things yeah. and so um she says oh dear pudding let's let's go outside you have eternity here can't you feel the love she goes oh i feel the love so they went to the back where the kitchen was and walked out the back door and went down the porch down into the yard and i, I don't know why she didn't catch it but everything was looked dead i could see what she was seeing because i was watching it and um uh, and she goes, oh, this is so beautiful. But to her, it probably looked like the beautiful green scenery. But I could see how she saw, too, at the same time. She could see beautiful scenery. I could see the deadness. I could see what was going on. Mm -hmm. 
it was like you know you're in a horror movie don't go that way you know don't open that door well she opened the door she when they went out down into the yard and says you're putting why don't you do you feel the love here yes i do why don't you go under the rest under the shade of those trees to your favorite spot i'll go in and bake you your favorite cookies you have eternity here and her grandmother smiled that evil grandmother look and um she um and it wasn't her grandmother it, it was the most hideous grin i've ever seen she didn't catch it she just walked down there and found her favorite rock in between two trees and, and she but trepidation kept hitting her she kept hearing something or smelling something it wasn't quite white but she sat down she reached into what she thought was water and all she pulled up was sand because there's no water in, in hell she just pulled up the sand and at that moment she realized this was not paradise then it hit her these creatures that look like trees were actually like squid like things and they engulfed her and she shrieked and people go uh, oh, that's horrible well, this, this lady, um, everyone thinks that she was the best person in the world. She was a member of the PTA. She was, you know, she was a community member, poor, give to the poor type. She did all these things. She did all these wonderful things. But she was a hellion to her kids. She had a particular, I saw this hairbrush. I can still see it when I close my eyes. I could see the crimes that she committed. <laughs> And she would beat her kids mercilessly for, like, in this family, you're going to be a doctor. You're going to be a dentist. You're going to be a lawyer. You're going into politics. And if you don't, I'm going to, you know, bam, bam. And you're not going to be a firefighter. You're not going to be a waitress. You're not going to, you're, you know, she's going to beat it into you what you're to be. She did the same thing to her husband. But everybody else around her, she was a saint. Yeah. Um, so the real you was being exposed because that's what she saw. She saw all that, how she beat her kids and how what a hypocrite she was. And she wasn't getting better. She wasn't remorseful about it. She got worse <laughs> because her real sin nature was coming out. I can't explain it better than that. And every person inside these cells were isolated. And they only had was the demonic entities in there. They were in there like they were never ending nightmares. As soon as that nightmare ended, they were in another one. And in the scenery of, of the time period of which they lived, that's what I was seeing. I went through acres and acres and through and watching these things as we were in there. And that's the nature of hell. It exposes what you really are. Um, Luke chapter 16 talks about the rich man and Lazarus there. And so well, and when, I, when, when, I, when I read that, I go, oh, I can see what the rich man was doing. He was control freak. You know, get me out of here. I'll go tell my buddies. You know, he was trying to make it. He, he, he real him was coming out. He's a deal maker. And, <laughs> and he's a, and he was boss and he was boss and Lazarus too. Like he's like uh, like people have said that when you're in hell, that you still have the same mentality. And he was like still trying to boss Lazarus around because remember, like they knew each other and died mm -hmm. around the same time. And yeah. He's still kind of bossing around. It's like, come put some water on my tongue, you know. Cool exactly. Out. Not, you know, it's a good thing you saw that, T, because not many people, when they read that scripture, see that. And it verifies what I'm saying because they really, the real them comes out. They just get worse and worse and worse. You think they'd reform? No, not at all. They, they get worse. And uh, they don't, their sin nature is fully birthed and full. And, you know, they're trying to make deals, they do all this stuff. And so there's what I call it was just degrees of recompense. Like the Bible says that it'll be in these two cities, you know, it'd be more tolerable in Sodom and Gomorrah than for these two cities. You know, there's levels of torments. The lower you go in the pit, the more the levels of torment increase. Above, it kind of, it's more boredom it's in, and it's a little slower. But all these uh, cells are like on this conveyor belt that move ever so slowly to the lower levels. Very strange thing to see. Oh my God! So that those were the things I was seeing, and um, you know, the so Bible. Everything you said is like biblical, like uh, like you're saying, like you're thirsty. You know, the Bible mm -hmm. says, and you said there's no water there, and they say mm -hmm. the Bible says it's a place of thirst, mm -hmm. a place of torment, a place of agony, mm -hmm. and people. 
did you hear because and it says it's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth you know on, on, and i know did you hear wailing and weeping did you uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's under that's an understatement all the time it? It, was, it was it was like a cacophony of roar i mean i can still hear it and it stinks it's it's oh the God. worst odor it's very hot it's like like bill we said i heard him preach on this it's like your eyeballs are going to melt out of their socket that's how hot it is and um in yeah you're banished it's just it's just oh man okay go ahead i didn't mean to interrupt oh. you oh no you're fine no it's like you can't breathe i'm sure because like like there's no air down there or something no. you know yeah. yeah, but yeah, air came out of you to facilitate your speech, but you don't breathe. That's the weirdest thing is you don't, you know, when you die, it's not breathing in me, but you're still alive. I can't explain it, but, <laughs> but, but that's the, but air came out of me naturally to say, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, as fast as I could. And all these entities that were, that were around me were trying to get me to curse God, curse it. We, and these things would come up and punch me and try to distract me, trying to get me to blame God for allowing this place. All I could say was, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. I didn't want to argue with them. And, and what was amazing is every one of my arguments that I had against God, I was being confronted with there in a way. I almost had it. I wrote in my book the best way I could. It was like being answered. And so I wrote it the best way I could in my book. And how I got my answer, you know, Brian, you're a dummy. You are a fool for trying to argue with God. And so I was an atheist. And uh, and I saw the nature of the place and why the people were there, you know. And then we came to this area where it looked like to me telephone poles were and, and stuck out of the walls of heaven and going up. And I, for some reason I could see, granted this ability to see that they extended up out of the earth over different geographic locations of the earth and on top of these poles were these great big entities and and you know about two years later i was in a church and i got involved to and that was the first time i ever heard of ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 ever read or taught on in my life I talked about we war against not flesh and blood but against principalities powers host of wickedness and mm -hmm. You know, in heavenly places, that's exactly what I was seeing. I was seeing the operation of this stuff. At the time, I had no knowledge of what I was seeing, but it just made an impact on me so much. But when I heard that scripture and the preacher preach on that, I go, that's the place, that's what I saw. So that's what I said to myself. I got excited. This is, I got an answer. I kept finding my answers in the Bible, mm -hmm. the only place I found them. And so, so these things were up there and they were singing. Um, they were doing dirges. They were humming and it was through uh music it's like a and it's this this ambiance they project over geographic location that would get people to act a certain way and if they need help they would conjure uh the into these the entities at the bottom of the poles they scamper up and out once they get permission to go and they get up and they go and they go and what they were doing is to get people to entrap people into that sin in order to get them there to seal them before they can find jesus oh my goodness. that's what they were doing mm -mm -mm. Mm -mm -mm. so yeah the enemy he he really just wants people because he knows his fate he wants to bring mankind with him mm -hmm. and, you know. and he knows his time is numbered and they do too they know their day is coming you know and so um that was an amazing thing to see that at the time i didn't understand it i just saw it but it was like after i came back it was all everything i everything anything that answered it was found in the bible so that's where i found it and i was drawn directly into the bible after this it was like the bible was my own i was drawn right to it and so um you got so, to see what we read in the bible like mm -hmm. i mean we read yeah yeah you granted that you were granted that yeah and so that's that's what I saw how these entities work, and I saw this one horse-headed entity up there. It looked like it had scales, but it was little entities just like itself. And it would go up the pole, and its whole duty when it went off, it would immediately fly down, and all these little things fly off it. Billions of them fly off of them because these things are, you know, they look small, but they're actually very large. And it would fly through the through the sky and drop these things off, and they go into certain people's hearts oh, and eat out their conscience and they would use it for sexual assaults of all types oh, 
and, um, and perversion be, beyond belief and self-mutilation of uh, things like that and really warp people's mind. And uh, it, looking back and researching it, pretty much it would be what you would see them do would be the, you know, what, the, what went on at Epstein's Island <laughs> type things. Mm-hmm. That's the type of people that were affected. I'm just, I, won't, I don't want to get, get you guys banned <laughs> like go any further than that. But that's what this thing was doing. And this thing would be released in different places and more of them would go up. And it was, just, it was incredible to see. And so we went through the cubes and went around the cubes. And I kept, you know, I was growing weaker and weaker. And um, I wanted to wake up. And this was getting quite long. And, and like I tell people and i saw a practicing witch that was in a coffin trying to scratch to get out and what she was doing was she was doing what ezekiel chapter 13 talks about this was no witch wannabe or uninitiated witch people who know what i'm talking about and if you came out of the, of the of that new age movement or came out of witchcraft or satanism you know what i'm talking about their initiation and levels. This is the high order one. This is this lady knew what she was doing. When I say Ezekiel chapter 13, suggest people to read Ezekiel chapter 13, verses 17 through 21. Uh, use the King James, use the New King James, use the ESV and the NASB, particularly those verses, and, and also the um, New Living Translation. Just compare what it's saying. This per- These people that this person represented was a person who had killed people before their time. This, this was the nasty of the nasty, most high order, high ranking ones, the most initiated, the one that um, Alice Bailey would talk about uh, becoming a cella and then a full blown initiate who would, you know, um, get in contact with spiritual entities to attack people and kill people before their time in order to create a utopia on earth. That's what this type of person was. So this person was scratching on there and it symbolized her putting to death people and she couldn't get out of the coffin i imagine she's probably still in there (laughs) and uh and she was just getting worse and worse her real real her how she hated god hated christians and she's just going that's who she targeted it the most or anybody in the opposition that was the type of person this individual was we walked by that and then we walked lower and to another level and then we came to a particular cell this is near the end of the experience for me there's a lot more i can talk about but i don't want to it'll be too long to get into every detail but you know i um, was getting very weak and at the time i you know i uh, you're separated this was the most uh, awfulest experience i ever had in my life because i was I got to a place, and like I said, your your cell, wherever it was above, will, will, will go into lower, lower levels. This was the one that I entered in. This is where this would be eventually. And this cell that had the front of it open and looked like a green dentist chair, but it's not a green dentist chair because that was actually an entity. All these entities were in there, these demonic-looking creatures and stuff, t- different shapes and sizes were there. And... This was my cell. This was this, and I deserved this place. And um, I start crying because I can't help it either. You know, after all these years, so, um, um, so you gotta excuse me if I, if I. Um, oh. Uh, I- but anyway, but anyway, I was, uh, my feet were like in this uh, dusty, muddy mire. So that makes sense. A little white moss flying up and little wormy things coming out, and I was in bare feet, and being, I was being dragged into this place. And all these creatures are there or mocking me. Or this is this was what the entity mentioned. If I curse God, curse them, curse the devil himself, offer half of me the kingdom to come into my cell to torment me. That's what his <laughs> offer was. And um, and so I and I was being dragged into it because that's how I live my life, like that. And at uh, that, that moment, I felt alone. Uh, there was no hope. I don't know if anybody understands in a place where you have utterly no hope. This is it. This is eternity. I couldn't. I wanted to tell my mom and dad. You know, don't tell the minister I'm not a good old boy. <laughs> but I. But I couldn't. There, there's no way to tell anybody. You want to tell people, but you couldn't. But you knew this is where I deserve. 
And I felt a presence coming behind me, and I thought it was the devil was going to throw me in there. Something was going to throw me in there. But the closer the presence got, the more the demonic creatures in there began to get more frantic, and they just took off running out of there. Because I felt the, in, the person behind me walking up, and, and his, his, his feet would, every footstep would shake. It would shake, vibrate the ground. It reminded me if you ever lit off the in 80s or something, if you're too close, the ground shakes. The ground shakes. And that's what it vibrates. And uh, bam, bam, just like a bam. It's like every footstep was, and I didn't know what to expect. I could stare at this thing, and I thought, this is it. This is my place. I deserve this. And, uh, and then um, he picked me up, and it was Jesus. And... And um, he had holes in his wrist, and he mm -hmm. picked me up, and, oh. and, and and his bones pulled apart. And I understood immediately what that meant. Mm. Now, I did that to him, mm. evidenced by how I lived my life. Now, people think, here's Judas. Judas, you know, plotted with betrayers to get rid of Jesus. I, I, I did that. I betrayed friends. Um, I abandoned friends, like in the garden. Everybody abandoned Jesus. I put people on trial in my mind. I mocked. I actually beat them. Um, I put heavy burdens on them they could not bear to go be crucified on. I did all those things. When he picked me up, I saw all that. And <laughs> I, rep I wept so hard on the shoulder because he carried me out of there. And he carried me up. And all I got to say is that I owe Jesus my life right now because of that. Because I know where I'd be mm -hmm. if it wasn't for him. And for every purpose or reason, if only he knows is not mine. I'm and not for my glory, only his. He carried me out of there. Went back up and to, amazingly back to the same cell I entered into. You know, I don't know how all this works, but this is how it works. And um, went through the same tunnel with him, the vortex, and came right back to the rock, kind of like, I was, he just held me, and he spoke to me some words, and uh, it was very firm, he, he had a hood on, and, and I knew if he took off his hood, uh, there would be a threefold witness, and I, that, that cell would be mine, for, for, that, that's where I was headed, and um, he was very firm, very fair, and what people don't realize that in order to be people like to define God's agape love or agapeo love as only meaning unconditional but that's a condition that means you can do anything you want to no and there's so many if you do an etymology study on the word agape agapeo and look up the how it's uh, how it's trans, agape is translated in the Septuagint and the Latin and so forth, etc. You get this definition that puts teeth to it. I know God unconditionally takes care of, nurtures every body without our conditions getting away in it. He also has unconditional love, sets boundaries and standards. That's part of nurturing. And you have standards and you have boundaries. Walk out of them, all hell breaks loose. You don't believe me? Read the news. What do you see in the world? What do people want? They don't want these rules, regulations. They don't want God's order and design. You get hell on earth. And um, the God's love has boundaries. God's love chastens. God's love will punish. God's love loves those who come to him, and he will keep the wicked away to protect yeah. those he loves. If you think love is unconditional and you can waltz into heaven that you're allowed to do anything and you don't need boundaries, I challenge you to do the Proverbs thing. Next time you go in the mountains, go pet a, 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 a cub. Go pick up a, a cub of a mama bear and say how cute it is and see what the mama bear does to you. Love protects. <laughs> and so, you know, people don't realize that. And that's what, you know, when he... That's what I kind of, like, years it took me to, to decipher this. I won't say any more than that. It wasn't at that particular time, but because what, I was, what was revealed to me about God's love took me at least 20, 30 years to, to figure it out, what he was saying to me. But I'm just giving you a hindsight thing. But when he, I stood in there, and he looked at me, and I went back through the dark void, the back of the way I came, and... Um, 
and so that's what I did. And he, uh, I saw the rock in the light, went in the distance and went, came back. I went through this, I was above the, the house, went through the ceiling like in, in, a, in a nanosecond. I was above my body, I floated in my body. As soon as I landed, I feet first into my feet and then in my body, I could not breathe. When I got up, the pain came back, fever, everything. Uh, this part is very cloudy because I do not remember. I don't know if I ran outside. I don't think I did. Or I know the neighbor was going to check on me. So after he got, uh, it was, I think it was a Saturday. I can't remember what day it was exactly. But I think it was a Saturday or maybe it was Friday. I have to look on the calendar when, when um, uh, the 4th of July was in 1980. So, but anyway, he... He, he, he found me, he was getting me in his truck, and he took me to the hospital. My head was down, I hitting in the, the glove box of his Ford truck, Ford truck, I think, yeah, Ford 150. And, and I was bouncing my head on there, and I left my body a few times floating above the truck, and I was, I asked him afterwards, why did you run through so many red lights? There's no reason to. And you almost got hit by a Ford, uh, Ford you know, another Ford truck uh, coming at you. And I described the car, everything to him. And he goes, how did you see that? <laughs> your, your, your head was down by your knees. You're, you know, you were out of it. And he got me to the hospital. And um, I somehow, I don't even remember how I got into the emergency room or whatever. And they, they took me in. I was in a room before I knew it. And they couldn't draw blood. My blood was viscous, they said. And then... Uh, they gave, they got an IV and his nurse, this is before they had pumps. So she was just squeezing this solution, IV solution into me. And by a miracle of chance, it's just how God designed thing. My ER physician was from India. who happened to have seen many cholera and people who have drinking bad, drank bad water cases. <laughs> he knew probably what it was because you can pinch your skin. Yeah, I think, I mean, yeah, I remember him pinching my skin and stuff. And uh, I thought that was weird. But anyway, now I know why, because that's one of the, your, you lose your elasticity in your skin. And so they treated me to recover from cholera. Who knows what else? I think it was probably Shingella as well. And then, you know, I, they gave me test results. I was tested for typhoid as well, but typhoid came back, thankfully, negative. Um, so I had a, con uh, so. Uh, I recovered. I don't know exactly how I got back, and I think a friend could have picked me up. Or my, it's all this part's so cloudy. I got back to the duplex there in, in Tucson, and I set. They were all going to work next day, so so the holidays must have been over, or whatever it was, or the weekend, and so I sat down in a beanbag chair. I couldn't go to work. And I had the medication I was on, they gave me, and they told me how to hydrate myself and Gatorade and other um, non-citric fruit juices, so forth, et cetera. And that's what I was doing. So I sat in the beanbag chair in the house, and after they left, and I just, and it's hot in there, you know, it's 94 degrees in the swamp cooler going, but <laughs> that's cool for Tucson. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I'm sitting there and I just looked up at the ceiling I said uh, I said uh, Jesus you know Lord Jesus I never want to go back to that awful place take me I'm yours that's how I got born again because I felt a cool breeze enter my body that's all I can say it just enter me and I haven't been the same since I had my problems a lot of my same issues that I've always had it took a process to get rid of them you know, I still had at that time in 1980, I had, I still had a drinking problem. And when I got back into church, I had to get, had to get out of me. It wasn't an easy road by any means, but from the time I said that prayer to when I started going to church and getting involved in church was, was in a period of about nine months. And uh, everything changed. It changed. And I was driven into the Bible immediately because the Bible was the only book that made any sense when I read it. I don't know why, but it did. And because uh, the answers, I would find them in there in the book of Psalms or something, just reading it. They told people, tell me to read the Psalms and Proverbs. Okay, I read those. Psalms really came alive. And then read the book of John. They always say that. And I read that. It made sense to me. And then I 
came, like I said, came across other scriptures and uh, just, uh, uh, so I came across Ezekiel chapter 32 about the pit of hell and I got involved in church and studying Greek and Hebrew and all this other stuff and rest is history. <laughs> so <laughs> Praise so that's God. my testimony there in a nutshell. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> I'm glad. Yeah, I give. I I love hearing your testimony. Wow, just like it makes me want to cry because I'm just like how you know because I feel like look how his mercy, look at God's mercy because you know what I mean like you you could have stayed there, you mm -hmm. could have stayed there and you didn't have you know but he was merciful towards you. Mm -hmm. I thank God. I mean, I thank him, you know, thank God for that. Because yeah. it, just like me, anybody, anybody, you know, we could we could all, you know, go to we can walk out our door today mm -hmm. and go if you're not right with God, you can you can walk go right, to, you know, go to hell. Mm -hmm. And we, you won't be able and you won't come back like you were able to, praise God. Thank you know. Yeah. Well, it kind of weighs heavily on me. Right, I got PSD from the experience. I didn't even know what PSD was until years later they came out with a term. So um, mm -hmm. I had it. I didn't know it, but I had it. But um, that was, you know, and I had to come to terms with it. And the Lord helped me. I actually had an experience where he allowed me to get a glimpse of heaven that calmed me out, calmed me down about seeing hell and gave mm -hmm. me some more answers about it. But I always weighs heavily on me, even to this day, is. I come back and some people call the survivor's guilt. It's real. Uh, I ask myself someday, I'm not so much because I've come to terms with it, but you know, why me? Why? You know, I, I know I don't deserve to come back. <laughs> I know that for a fact. I know that way better than anybody. I don't deserve this come back. I deserve a second chance. And I always ask, why me? You know, I don't know. I don't have an answer. All I can say is the only answer I found in the Bible was just purely God's grace. Um, maybe people were praying for me, which I know my parents were, and I know other people. I was had a whole slew of people praying for me with my reputation. So, um, and you never know. So I just tell people, you, you, you know, pray for the hopeless cases. You know, they can get saved too. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. And he, he loves you. He loves you and he loves us. And mm -hmm. that's why, that's why. And when he was on the cross, he was thinking about you. Mm -hmm. And, and me, and me too, and you know, and it's so awesome. You were able to see him with his holes in his hand. Just see him, and then, and then I was thinking, like when he was when he was standing on the rock, he 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 wasn't. We know he's the caring, loving Jesus, but he was in the judgment mode when he, he was had in judgment mode head, when he had that hood on his head. It and says it. Yeah, he says it. He says that uh, the Father's giving them all judgment, and that. Uh, People don't understand that in the book of was it, was it Deuteronomy or Leviticus, I can't remember right now, but it talks about a threefold witness. In order to put somebody to death, you need a, a witness of two people. Three yeah. seals the deal. Now, I was standing before the Lord. It was, this is more frightening than hell that I don't get a chance to tell people about. Standing before the Lord, having your real you exposed, and you, and you don't have no excuse. And you're standing there. You can't have nothing. You can't say anything. And you have... Uh, you know, a threefold witness ready to lay the hammer on you. And Jesus was literally standing in the gap for me. Wow. And then I, I know that more than any, if I start crying now, Is I it? know that, I know that more than anything. He died and he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And I tell people this all the time. If you're listening to me, like Judas, who have you threw under the bus for 30 pieces of silver? Mm. Was it a bunch of beer, a bunch of alcohol, drugs, pornography? What have you sold out your family for? What you betrayed them for, huh? And then I, and I, I, it sounds, you know, God loves you. He's trying to rebuke you. He said, Father, forgive them. If they know not what they do. Do you see how you were abandoned, rejected? Maybe that put the hurt in your heart to do that. He wants to heal that. Okay. Well, and then he, go, and he goes on, he starts to show you, you go, how many people you put on trial with your mind? How many people you put a heavy burden on? How many people are, you were like, uh, like Herod with Jesus standing in front of him saying, well, you dance for us. Prove that I might believe you. Let's see some sign or a miracle. Ha, 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 ha. Mm -hmm. How many times you've done that? You know, uh, and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then and he says, whoever looks upon me on the cross will be saved. Now you know what you had done. That's what he forgave you for. So great of a love that was 
that Jesus Christ did to expose what we're really like to each other and to God. We know it now. We look upon him and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what to do. That's how you get born again. Just place your simple trust and faith in him. He washes all the garbage away. He makes you new inside. You will go through a process and you will reveal how many times your heart was broken. How many times your spirit's been crushed? How many times you've been hurt, molested, whatever? You know, he's going to heal those wounds. And, and you're going to show you everything that it caused and messes up your life. And you walk in a slow process or a fast process, you'll heal that in your life. He'll get you into the Bible, too, and, and take you into places you never thought you would go. He'll heal your wounds and hurt. This is a great, powerful love for Jesus to come and die in our place, to pay our sin debt. And people always wonder, go, um, you know, how could you know God? You know, Jesus fulfilled all the law for us, and and the law was fulfilled by human beings laying their hands upon the sin offering and confessing their sin upon Him. That part was fulfilled. That was our iniquity being transferred on Him. That's how God did that. He did it through legally through the through the law. <laughs> To impute sin to Jesus, how he said it through the law, so Jesus could pay our price for our sin debt in full, so we we escape the very wrath of God. Jesus bore the wrath of God, suspended between God and man on earth. I can't de- describe how that, that that type of love blows my mind to expose what we are like on each, to to God and to each other, to family, friends, and strangers how we treat them, and then he exposes that, and then he took our wrath and our place for doing that, and we did it to him, whoever we done to the least of these, there you got it. And it's like, you know, he came to forgive people of their sin, but people don't think they're sinners, they don't think they're wretches, but I challenge you, who have you betrayed? Or have you been betrayed? How did that make you feel? What did it do to you? How does it make you act? Now you know. You have to come to Christ. If that's you, you just need to bow your head and say a simple prayer. And I just ask you to pray right now with me. Okay? Just say, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. Never want to go to that awful place. Never want to go to that awful place. Forgive me. Forgive me. Take me, I'm yours. Take me, I'm yours. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. And I just ask you, if you have some stuff you need to get off your chest and talk with God, I just ask you to take the time, put the show on the road here, put it down, and just get a, do some carpet time, as I say. You and Jesus need to get alone and weep and cry, whatever you're going to have. Because mm. you got questions, you got anger, whatever. And let, pour it out on him. Just pour it out on him. He can take it. He'll answer your questions. That's right. So just, just do that, and you'll become born again. By simple faith in what he did upon the cross to expose what we're really like to each other, paid our price for doing it so we can enter heaven. There, that, that type of love is far greater than anything I can wrap my head around. <laughs> Amen. Exactly. Amen. Exactly. And just, just thinking about standing in front of a just God and you're not right with him, it's horrifying. Mm-hmm. It's horrifying. You. Like you just said, you oh God, this is just thinking about that because I I had an experience, but I uh, I wasn't being judged. But Jesus, I did see it was a, a vision. I had mm-hmm. seen him in the sky. It was so many years ago, and I wasn't wrecked. Like he was coming back, like for the rapture, and this was many years ago. And and I had saw him in the sky, and I wasn't ready. And I hate to even think about that vision because it was so horrifying. It was horrifying. That uh, so just you saying you be standing in front of him being judged. Oh my God, it's just yeah, yeah. It's it's terrifying. If you're not right with God, we guys guys we urge you to get right now. Amen. And if you say it because this uh this this hell is a real place. Hell is a real place, and we will be judged when you leave your body. We are living. So we're living spirits inside of us. This is just a vest. I mean, this what is just this is just flesh. <laughs> yeah, just flesh. Some people call it an earth suit. I don't know. I just <laughs> yeah. 
Exactly. An earth suit. And when you <laughs> when you leave this earth suit, you're gonna go to either heaven or hell. This is this is not playtime. Like someone said, it's not time for play play. <laughs> it is time to get right with the Lord. And I uh I just thank him for his for his grace and his mercy and uh and I think about times I could have died and, and died of my sin. And I was a prodigal. And I recently just turned my heart back to God. So this, you know, it touches my heart. And I just, I thank him for his mercy, for his grace. And he wants sinners. He wants to, he came for the sinners. He came. What's the, the scripture says? He, I have not called, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And that's Luke 5, 32. But you, you know, to see, to enter the kingdom of God, guys, you must be born again. Mm -hmm. You must be born again. You, if you leave your body, if your spirit comes at your body, you, you know, you, you, uh, and you not right with the Lord, you know, you, you uh, you know, I hate to say that. <laughs> I hate to say it. it's it's either heaven or hell. That's and right. so and so he wants to, he's not willing that any should perish, but all but all to come to repentance. And if you you know, and that and hell was not made for humans. And and brother Melvin, you know yourself, hell was not you seen it. Hell mm -hmm. was not made for humans, it was made for the devil and his angels, the fallen angels, and 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 uh and I know in the, in the scripture said that even they were cast into hell. It says, uh, 2 mm -hmm. Peter 2, 4, it says, mm -hmm. For God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered mm -hmm. them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. They're going to be judged, too. They're going to be yep. judged. Too. They're in, yeah. So, I mean, hell is a place, guys. Hell is a place. And uh, time to time to get right with the Lord. Time to get right. And if you did, if you said that, if you, uh, you said the prayer with Brother Melvin, then let let him know in the comments, right in the comments, that you said that prayer with him. And also, we have some questions in the okay. comments. Um, All right. One says, uh, "When you said, when you said that it seemed as though at first there were people that that were trying to welcome you to paradise." So does it look nice at, for them changes, or do you know it's not right immediately? Let me, I don't know. Let me well, see. for me, and I saw enough in there that other people saw too, um, you think that you don't know where you're at at first, but then everything looks okay because you see it really, it looks nice. And it uh, looks like something you, you're, you're familiar with too. And... So that's how it is. Yeah, you kind of think this is this is paradise. This is this could be heaven, you know, but just a little bit longer. If a person uh, stays there long enough, they're going to find out real quick. This is not not paradise. That's probably one of the reasons the Lord wanted me to come back and uh, share this is that I had no idea what an after death experience was or a near death experience at the time, and I had no idea that these. Uh, in the last 22 years or more would be coming more and more prevalent due to medical science resuscitating people back. Now, people who died when they were kids, and I talked to them, um, they, they, they probably did see heaven and they probably met Jesus and all that, just like they think. But life itself and the way things are can excuse that vision that they had. And I don't doubt that they seen heaven because I, there were never any children in hell that I saw. Now there are there's an age of accountability, and what that age is 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 an age of moral reasoning. And I can't tell you um, when a kid is going to be at that moral age of reasoning, but a two year old definitely ain't there. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> a one year old or an infant is not there. They don't they only live for the here and now. You know, mm -hmm. you know. So, but. Mm -hmm. There's an age of accountability, and it's and it's fluid. Even disabled people, who um, DD people, I work with DD people as a social worker. You know, they they don't have the mental capacity to to reason. They're not there. I can guarantee you, they're not there. Yeah. God's grace is much greater than what some people think it is. Yeah. And um, but but you know, but for uh, for people who have a um, 
we, we, most of adults reach this moral age and you're a teenager or whatever, you reach a moral age of reason and accountability. And uh, you need to be born again by God's Spirit because God, the Holy Spirit will take up residence in your heart, will lead, guide you, and instruct you in the way you should go from now on. And um, it's, a, it's the best experience you could ever do. It changes your life and sets you free of so many things. I'm not going to kid you. It's, it's a process. Uh, I always use this illustration to make the process understandable. Is simply that, you know, there was a blind guy out there and Jesus put, put, put he spit in the ground, put mud in his eye, put, put mud in the sockets of his eyes and told him, now you just go down, you know, and then walk a couple of miles, blind guy, down to the pool of Siloam and wash. You know, you know, that sounds kind of mean. Why didn't Jesus take him there himself? No, he had to go get healed through a process. Mm -hmm. Got down there, Wash did what he said, and he, and he got his eyes back, and he was born blind, no eyes, eyes in the sockets. And then he goes and gets immediately attacked by the Pharisees and scribes and testifies of Christ, and finally he sees Jesus after the experience. <laughs> <laughs> Follows him the rest of his days. Amen. Amen. You know, so that's the process. Like I said, sometimes it takes a process. You don't understand it, but when you go through it, you get stuff. You know, I call it, you get the junk out of your trunk. No other way to put it. You just get the stuff out of your heart. That shouldn't be there that's causing the problems but I mean, he gently takes it away he's he's just a, a awesome wonderful guy if you if you just think yeah about how how what he did for us for with his son he put his son in place you know of us and like you said like yeah he t and did it all at one time because we can never pay back our sins. We can never. We can never. No. The Bible's clear. It says the devil captures people to do his will. And you don't want to be found captured. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're going you're gone to the place where the devil and, his, uh, the, and the minions go. All of them. Right. And they're, and they, they're not going to be uh, your best friends. I'm <laughs> you, <laughs> no. It's going to be a party place. Oh, I, I am already living in hell. No, 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 honey. No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, 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 it's real. And you can't. And that's what the thing is when you. That's why you make your choice now while you're on earth. Mm -hmm. that's right. You can't because it's, it's for eternity. You It's either life. You choose life or choose death. So, any other know. questions or anything else we have no. here? Uh, one more thing. Uh, it says, at any moment he could have stopped any part of what he did for us, but no one, but he did it for us, all of us. Oh, <laughs> that's yes, awesome. Amen. One, yes. one more comment. My daughter and I were speaking of that the other day, how Jesus, even on the cross, was asking forgiveness for not only the very people who were rejecting him, them but all of the ones to come praise him all glory belongs to god yes amen he is amazing he is amazing so so uh brother melvin your book what how are they able how are people able to get your book uh land unknown health and meaning how are they well you can get it online on uh that's if i can hold up so the green screen doesn't did it there it is okay okay Oops, I got the right yep, I the land unknown um and hell's dominion is by bw melvin it's my writer's name a land unknown hell's dominion you get it off of amazon.com that, that's worldwide or you can go to your christian bookseller or barnes and noble or whatever bookseller and ask them to order it for you okay awesome and that's what you do <laughs> Awesome, awesome. Are you are they able to contact you on any platforms? Um, they can con yeah, I have a YouTube channel and a website too, but you go to my website and I'm trying to upgrade it, so I just uh, I'm working on it now to try to upgrade it. So it's really old fashioned looking, but okay. it's um it's called After Hours Ministries. It's all one word, A F T E R Hours H O U R S and Ministries is plural M I N I S T R I E S dot com after hours ministries. On it you'll see a, a video clip of me giving my testimony and a short clip of that. And then it'll link you to some of the videos and take you right to my YouTube channel as well. And then there you can, my contact information's all on that as well. 
the email address to contact me, um, all that information's there. Awesome. So also, we'll I'll put it in the comments later, guys. So if you didn't if you didn't catch it, I'll put it in the comments later, so you can uh, if you so you can get in touch with uh, Brother Melvin. So also, do you have a, a way that if they want to give to your ministry also? Is uh, yeah, the same? Want, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, right on the website, there is a PayPal button. Or you can do, uh, you can go to, I have my, my Gmail account is on there too. It's uh, my Gmail email account, I should say, is, is bwmelvin, M-E-L-V-I-N. BW Melvin number one at gmail.com. And you can use PayPal that way, or you can try another, an old, old account. I saw the, the, um, the, the uh, email for it. It's Brian, B R Y A, B R Y A N, Melvin, M E L V I N number one at AOL.com. Either one of those. And you can reach me at those yeah, addresses too. But I'm swamped with emails, so sometimes I'm so sorry. I can't, I don't have a staff to help me answer anything. I wow. some of these go right by. It's really sad. Sorry about that, but I'll try to get to you. <laughs> well, see, it's because God is using you. I think that's wonderful. That's why. That's why you swamp. <laughs> yes. So. so Guys, also, so if you want to get in touch with uh, me and Minister Rochelle on the Truth Live, you can go to our Truth Live International Talk Show uh, Facebook page. And also, uh, right now, I do want to shout out HOD Radio Network. We're on HOD. We're, we're live right now. We're all over the world. Uh, they're located in Nigeria, but we're but it goes all over the all over the world. We're so hi to hello to England and France and everywhere. <laughs> We're all over right now. And so uh, if you like, we, so we sent, we put, we're going to put uh, Brother Melvin's contact information. So if you guys want to get in touch with him and, uh, and uh, me and Minister Rochelle at Turnaround Ministries. So, guys, if and also, like I said, if you did say the sinner's prayer, put in the comments. So, guys, we, we appreciate you guys joining us for today. Uh, we love you, Brother Melvin. Thank you so much for being on the program. I appreciate you. God bless you. I know I'm, I'm I just thank God for your heart, your beautiful heart. <laughs> and I know, and I know He's going to continue to bless you more and more and more. And thank you for your faithfulness. Uh, I send you a a, a virtual hug and, uh, <laughs> and and, and uh, try to stay cool down there. I didn't know it was hot <laughs> in Colorado. I didn't know. Well, that. It's just one of those years it is. Everyone complains about climate change. I don't know when climate hasn't changed. I mean, <laughs> last time it was uh, a heat wave it was in Europe was like 40 years ago. It was in the winter time, And there was another heat wave about 20 years ago that was really hot. And people uh, about the same thing going on worldwide it happens in about every 20, about 20 year cycles. People just don't realize that it's a worldwide they phenomenon. They don't. Yeah. I've been around long enough. I experienced <laughs> a couple of them. So give me my age. It's <laughs> OK. Yeah, that's all right. Well, it stays hot here in Phoenix. So you already well, know. Yeah, I already know that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I I sure enjoy listening to your your testimony. It's awesome. God's going to continue to use you, and then people are going to be saved today through this program, guys. Like I said, send send us a message if you need help. If you want to, you know, talk to someone. If you need church home, send us a message and and blessing to you, guys. All oh, we love you. Thank you for watching the Truth Life, and take care. Uh -oh. <laughs> Thanks. Goodbye. Bye. Have a great day, guys. <laughs>